essays in, in a little book called Unpopular Opinions. And this comes, my title comes from that. And in one of her papers, which is about women in the labour market, she actually says that no one in power ever proposed that with the women of the poor should not work as they always had, paid and unpaid, doing things that were dirty, exhausting, and damaged their health. And that's where she says no angry and no compassionate voice. So she's basically saying that no one has ever cared about the labour paid and unpaid done by working class women. Um, it's a slight overstatement, but that's not quite about that. Okay, I'm going to say some, I'm going to take that my role here is to be provocative, because I think giving me gender is rather odd, because I would say Gabriel was a much better person to talk about gender, but we won't go there. And first thing I'm going to say about this whole initiative, Connect Mission, is I think it's too focused on schooling. Education does not equal schooling. And educational research should always challenge that lazy assumption. And if our concern is young people and poverty, or in poverty, I think a lot of the ways of dealing with that do not come out of schools at all. And there are all sorts of educational things which would improve the poverty of young people, which are nothing to do with schooling at all. Um, and of course there are all sorts of ways in which young people might get educated that are not related to schools at all, and might be more powerful and more useful. But just for a minute, if we think about their mothers and their fathers and the other adults in their households and their cousins and their siblings and things, there are some major educational problems that I think Vera should be thinking more about. Now, just for a minute, let's go to England and Wales. I've been slightly upstaged by the Queen's speech. This has never happened to me in my whole life. <laughs> but I wanted to say something about education in prison. We know that a huge proportion of male prisoners are actually undiagnosed dyslexics who had dreadful schooling, particularly older ones when there wasn't any, but you know, in general. Most of the men in prison, with the exception of a few people like Geoffrey Archer and John Lake, and it's been interesting that when they go into prison, what shocks them is the appalling level of scholarship, lack of people literacy and things. Really right-wing people like Geoffrey Archer come out saying they were absolutely appalled to discover that most of the other men in there couldn't read a letter if they had one. We know that standard of... And what would be the most likely thing to break that cycle? Diagnostic testing of dyslexia and really high-quality literacy and numeracy instruction in prisons. Beera hasn't looked at that ever. It's whole history as far as I know. We need that. And the other area is the armed services. What we've got at the moment in the army is we take in unemployable, unqualified 16 and 17 year old boys mostly, who come out, a lot of them come out of the care system and they are functionally illiterate and whatever. We turn them back out again at 26 and they're still unemployed school leavers, but they're 10 years older, they very often by then got children and they've got anger management issues and difficulties about, for instance, having a woman boss, and all sorts of things like that. And we, where are they? They're homeless, they're in jail, whatever. We're not using the opportunity of having those young men in the army. We don't educate them <coughs> while they're in there, and we don't have the same kind of leaving package. If you're an officer and you're leaving, you have six months on full pay to go and do work experience, unpaid internships in merchant banks and things, Oxbridge colleges, come and be an apprentice person, we do nothing. Well, there is, of course, the teaching. There is, of course, the issue about the teaching scheme. But at least they are expected to do a training course. I've got no problem with that. I'm worried about the unqualified infantry men who come out of the army as unqualified as when they went in, but with a whole list of other problems. They were homeless when they went in. They're homeless when they come out. They've lost all community ties and all rest of it. We're not doing anything about that. Now, we've got a lot of young people in poverty who've got relatives in jail and in the army. And if we were to do something serious about raising the educational levels and aspirations and knowledge bases and skills and employability of the prison population and the infantry men, we would actually be doing several things for young people. Because we'd be doing something in terms of role modelling. Cousin Fred went into the army unable to read, 
Ten years later, he comes out actually skilled in something. He's got an HGV license and he can read. And we're not doing any of that in any of the four nations. We've got a whole set of problems with FE colleges. Let's not go there for a minute. We've got a whole set of problems about access and second chance and part-time routes into higher education. Claire Callender's work on the vanishing of the part-time student is chillingly terrifying, particularly in England. It's not much better in the other countries. We've got a whole set of issues around non-formal and informal and voluntary sector things. Libraries, youth groups, scouts and guides, churches, mosques. All of those are places where one could do something about education that would help reduce poverty. I'm going to just say here, of course, for young men, there's a very strong pull of, to learn a martial art. And that is a whole area where people can be educated in a whole lot of things. Most martial art teachers, for instance, work very hard to keep the young men that they've got to stop them smoking and drinking and improve their diet. And of course, if you do one of the sort of mystical Eastern martial arts, there's a whole lot of philosophy and things there. Now, we might all think all that is rubbish, but how many unemployed, illiterate 18-year-old boys are actually learning to read in order to master a philosophy? We might think it's a not a good philosophy, but, it, you know, uh, it's not. If Bruce Lee can get people to think, let's, let's have Bruce Lee. Let's, I'm not worried about that. And then there's the whole area of social media. Now, there's not an area I know anything about at all, because as you all know, I'm completely IT-phobic. I'm like, so I don't, I, when Mike Donnelly asked me to do a beer or blog, I get it typed and it's sent to him, and he posts it, and I have never looked at one, because I don't know how to. I'm the only, I bet I'm the only person you know who doesn't have a mobile phone. Does anybody know anyone else with yeah, a mobile phone? None of them work in here, so yeah. you're okay, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that. Mean mobile phone. But I, and I have never, literally never touched a computer. So this really? is no, social media, it's not my area. Really? No, never. Why would I? Religious objection. No, I'm, I'm completely phobic. I actually throw up, but let's not go there. Um, <laughs> but it's also a political stats. Why the hell should I be sucked into giving money to international companies to do things I don't want to do? But if we take social media for a minute, my reading of the research in the States is that social media is actually widening class divides in education. Because although the number of hours spent on it doesn't vary dramatically by class, the use made of it is radically different. White, mm -hmm. middle and upper middle class American <laughs> school kids use social media and internet resources in a completely different way. Which, so the, actually social media are widening class activities. So, but I'm basically, it's, all I'm saying that about education is not really about schooling. I'm going to follow Philip Bourgeois, the ethnographer who studied crap dealing in the barrio, who says, you know, the streets are more powerful than the schools. And I don't think we should be having this whole beer initiative and focusing on schools. But let's, if I could do one thing, I would have school breakfasts, which would open the schools at half past six, which is a more useful time for working class people, would provide a lot of jobs for working class women to serve them. And also the teachers should come in then, but I think the schools should be open from half past six and there should be free breakfast and people should come in and have breakfast, and that would be more use to people who've got jobs because they could get to their jobs at the start of work, deal with a childcare problem for two hours before school, make an enormous amount of difference. If I could do one thing, I'd do that, and I think that would then ripple on through. Let's not go there. But I would argue that an access course for a mother, or literacy in a prison, or a better post-army programme, would probably do more than anything schools can or can do. Um, I think this is the thing about not being all about schools, it's particularly true of Wales, because the two biggest things that are, going, that are important in Wales at the moment are firstly, we're waiting for the Diamond Report on the funding of higher education. And at the moment, David will correct me if I'm wrong, but the figure that's being tossed around is that 9 million is leaving the education budget in Wales to go to English higher education institutions where Welsh students get their £9,000 fee paid, Welsh domicile students get their £9,000 fee paid by the Welsh government, or 6,000 of it. So Wales is actually paying for the University of Chester and the University of Worcester and the University of the West of England and in, because that's mostly where people domiciled in Wales a lot of them go. 
And it means that, to take a colleague of mine, I've said this to his face, I'm not saying behind his back, if you take Phil Brown, who has three children, well, three of them have chosen to go to university in England. Phil Brown, who is a full professor in my department, his three children are each getting a subsidy from the Welsh taxpayer of 6K a year, so their loan doesn't have to be nine, it only has to be three, for them to go to universities in England. Now, that is such a bleed on the Welsh education system, it beggars anything else. We're waiting for the Diamond Report to see what happens next. The other thing is the Chief Scientist has just done a major report on women and STEM in Wales. And that also is an extremely, if that's actually followed through by the new Welsh Government, that will change the employment and education landscape in Wales more than anything else. So, uh, but they're not to do with schools, particularly. And I think that's important. Right, I'd say two things about me. Um, I've done three sort of three areas of traditional educational research in my career. I've done quite a lot of historical work, I've done quite a lot of classroom ethnography, and I've done quite a lot of work on PhD students and their supervision. Um, starting with work I did for Beera with Jim Eggleston when he was president back in the early 80s. But since 2003, the main empirical work I've been doing is ethnography of two different martial arts, the Brazilian one, capoeira, and the French kickboxing, savate. Um, now, I think that's educational research because I've been studying how those martial arts are taught. And I would say that the main capoeira teacher I've watched and the savat teacher I watch are two of the most gifted teachers I have ever seen in my life. I spent a lot of time in schools, a lot of time in higher education observing, but I would say that some of those gifted and empowering and life-changing teachers I've seen are actually martial arts teachers. There's a guy in London who teaches an African-Brazilian who teaches a lot of African-Caribbean kids in London schools. Now, he's more life-changing for them in lots of ways, which we don't, you know. So I'm, it is educational research, but it's got nothing to do with schools or schooling. Um, and I think my most frustrating thing from my whole career is the way in which things are discovered, but they don't stick particularly around gender. I don't know if anybody else had listened to the Today programme this morning, but there was a discussion about what books should be read to small oh, girls. Yes. And there's a woman in America who's got crowdfunding to start producing books about real live women, like Marie Curie and Sojourner Truth and you know, real women who achieve things, women engineers and so on. And then there was a woman who writes fairy stories. And they were having an argument about should girls be given fact or fantasy. And there was this thing about fairy stories are full of drippy princesses going, go, come and rescue me from my tower. And this whole discussion happened with no mention at all of the feminist work of Alison Leary, who pointed out, she's a world scholar on children's literature, she pointed out 30 years ago that when people like the Grimms went out and collected the fairy stories from the peasantry, Actually, they didn't go, they said everybody employed women to go out and do it, but they leave that for a side. When people like the Grimm's got those bodies of literature, they went through them, and any story that was very sexual got censored. And any story in which had a heroine who was smart or strong or brave or clever, those were also not put in the canon. So we end up with drippy people like Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty. And we don't have the parallel stories in which women did clever things. And Alison Leary published a wonderful collection called Clever Gretchen and Other Fairy Stories about 30 years ago with a precise idea of being able to read fantasy stories that were gender-bending. And neither of these two people on this on today, the program, nor, the, nor the researcher who prepped the interviewer, apparently knew that. That our, our genre of Western fairy stories strips out all the clever, active women. Not necessarily true in all other cultures, of course, but just stick with we were sticking to it. I mean, Disney alone could change the ideas of young women if they filmed every single story in Clever Gretchen and other feminist fairy stories. If Disney made all those instead of Bloody Frozen, we could all get on. <laughs> okay, but that's not to do with education. And this is what I'm saying about, I think Beera needs to think this is not about, not necessarily about school. 
Although, of course, if we had Disney films about those fairy tales about heroines, actually, of course, you could put those into the schools and that would be good too. Um, I can say one tiny thing about feminism in the UK. I like to think of feminism in Britain as having three waves rather than sometimes people just think there are two. And if we think the first wave is about 1848 till about 1920, the award of the vote to a limited number of middle class women at the end of the First World War and the um, Sex Disqualification Removal Act that opened the professions to women. So after 1920, it was illegal to say a woman couldn't be an accountant or a, or a lawyer. That first wave, elite women campaigned to get entry for their type of lady, i.e. people who were certainly middle class or upper middle class and had financial means, to get into academic schools where they could or set up academic schools, like the Oxford Girls High School where my mum went, um, where they would do proper subjects. In other words, they wouldn't learn how to get in and out of a carriage without showing your ankle, they'd learn Latin. Get into universities, particularly the medical schools, get into the professionals and get the vote. Now, a lot of what they campaigned for was irrelevant for 80% of women at the time. Although, of course, once a woman was qualified as a doctor, she could actually then employ a servant. So that was the way it was going to trickle down, but that's so well. Then I like to think we have wave two, which is about 1920 to about 1960, and that's where Dorothy Sayers and Winifred Holtby and Vera Burton and a lot of other, Edith Summerskill, a lot of those sorts of women are. Um, Margaret Bonfield, the first woman Labour cabinet minister is on. And that's sometimes called social feminism and welfare, welfare feminism. And it was very much based on an <coughs> argument that women should use the vote and the education that they managed to get to improve the social position of women and children. Now, that women had the vote, and now they should use it to do things that should improve the lives of the rest of women. And that involved a whole lot of things, family allowances, family planning, the NHS, the 1944 Education Act, which, of course, solved the Olive Banks problem. Because we need to remember with Olive Banks that she grew up in a traditional working-class family in an era when, if you passed the scholarship, your parents had to say they'd keep you in school till 16, two years beyond the leaving age. Olive's brother, the family, of course, said yes, he could <coughs> pass, the, he passed the scholarship, he could go. Olive had to leave school at 14 because her father didn't believe it was worth educating women. Because when, at the end of the war, when Olive could go to university, because there was money if you'd done certain kinds of war work, by then she was married to Joe. She could only go to LSE because Joe signed the piece of paper giving his permission. Because she was his property by then. Her father couldn't stop her anymore because she belonged to Joe. And of course the 44 Act did away with that because it raised the school leaving age and made secondary education compulsory for both sexes. We sometimes forget that. The first, second wave feminists cam campaigned for equal pay for teachers in the state system. And they were, of course, very brave because they were in a generation where Freudianism was very powerful in intellectual circles and the old idea that feminists were spinsters who lived lives of rigid morality and were ladies who were, you know, very, very tightly moral in a celibate sense. Celibacy was a very important part of first wave feminism. Freudianism made that in deeply suspicious. If you, were a, if you were a spinster, you suddenly became a woman who repressed all her sexuality and was positively dangerous. The discourse of that period is quite scary. Um, and that, that era of Dorothy Sayers on, they also, of course, had the Great Depression. And it's very salutary to realise how near most of the girls' schools that had been founded in the first wave and most of the women's universities nearly went bankrupt after the 29 crash. Places like Vassar and Wellesley were hanging on by the skin of their teeth for about 20 years. A lot of the great girls' schools nearly went under because the parents didn't have the money to pay the fees for both the boys and the girls. And you can imagine who they didn't want to pay fees for anymore. And that's why the thing about the Oxford property prices is so fascinating. Because we might find, of course, that how do, who will families sacrifice for to keep them in the private sector? <laughs> 
But what we're seeing at the moment, of course, is the rolling back by the London government in England of every single thing those second wave feminists fought for. Without a murmur. I think it's quite, actually quite interesting that, um, I think it's quite interesting that we're rolling back things like family allowances. The notion that universal credit is to be paid to the male head of the household. What, you know, we know that the reason family allowances used to go to the mother was there was a belief that the women would spend it on the children. You didn't, wouldn't know what the man might do with it. But the notion of financial things and power in the household, of universal credit going to the male head of the household, there were quite a lot of protests. It yes, was, but I think it wasn't unnoticed. Well, in that case, well, but it is actually quite, it, it, it's not nearly as... It's not people out on the street, you're right. No, we haven't had the same things we had against the poll tax, for instance. I think yeah. that's quite interesting. Okay, wave three then would be current feminism from the late 60s onwards. And obviously that dealt a lot with issues around sexuality, abortion, all those kinds of things. Dealt a lot with removing remaining barriers to things like the jockey club and the kennel club and the stock exchange and things which still didn't admit women. And things like a woman couldn't get a, couldn't get a mortgage unless a man signed as her guarantor and those kinds of things. But the big thing about third wave feminism has been a complete challenge for disciplines. Because first wave and second wave feminism concentrate on trying to get people access to learn Latin and Greek and physics and algebra and Hebrew. Contemporary feminism is much more about saying, hang about, is the scholarship in classics actually a white male view of the world? What does classics look like if you focus instead on slaves, on illegal immigrants in Athens, on women? What does the classical world look like? And you know, trivially, that means we now have lots of scholarship on Sappho, where there really wasn't any before. It's that kind of thing. Jolly interesting. Not going to stop on that now. Um, not going to talk on any about that. But I think it's really quite important that we don't lose sight of um, we don't lose sight of aspects of wider policy that may be impacting on education. And an obvious one is the end of legal aid unless you're a domestic violence victim. We don't yet know what is happening to the poverty of children because of divorce without legal aid unless you're a domestic violence victim. And if we go back to the assisted places scheme research, um, one of the things that John Fitz always used to teach students very carefully was the important finding that the then Conservative Party hated that quite a lot of the children who got the assisted places, Jeff will leap up if I'm wrong, the way John always taught it was there were quite a lot of families who would have been sending their children to fee-paying schools if the marriage hadn't ended. And the, the lone mother who wasn't getting school fees as part of the divorce and therefore couldn't afford to pay them, but had been to a private school herself and wanted her children to have the upbringing she'd had, was exactly the kind of person whose child could get an assisted place because they were poor, but they had the cultural capital. Yeah. That's, that's, a central that's a central finding. And John was always very careful to teach that to students as a good example of how just looking to see what the household income is doesn't necessarily tell you what cultural capital you've got. Which is very strong in my biography because my grandfather was the Cecil Kimber of the MGs. And by the time my mother was born at the time he was sort of beginning to build them, by the time um, his factory was taken over in the war, compulsory purchased, and he died, he never got it back. But my mother lived through a family that rose from a time of being really quite modest to being really pretty wealthy in Oxford. But because she made the mistake of marrying my father against her father's wishes, he died in testate, but in any case, he had cut her out. He hadn't spoken to her for four years. So, and she then, having got divorced from my father, I was brought up with my two brothers in a cottage with a lavatory at the bottom of the garden and no bathroom. We had a tin bath in front of a cold fire where we heated a bucket from the Ascot and put it in, and we all three had a bath in it. So I was brought up, probably, I might have been the poorest person in my grammar school class, because I wasn't poor at all in cultural capital. 
because my mother had been to the Oxford Girls High School. She'd won a scholarship to St Anne's. Her father wouldn't let her take because he didn't approve of blue stockings. In the previous generation, her mother had been reared in Manchester in a family of a man who built railways all over Latin America. He built the railways in Brazil. He was very wealthy. He had seven daughters. He sent them all to the Manchester High School for girls. My grandmother was offered a place at Manchester to read modern languages. Her father wouldn't let her go because he didn't approve of educating women. So I come from a generation where I had this narrative of dreaming spires that they hadn't been allowed to go to because of their gender, and dreadful poverty. I mean, you know, not not starvation, and not the sort of poverty that's based on ignorance. We were fed very well, because my mother used to go out and pick fungi and blackberries and things. But cultural capital is very important. And I think we need to be thinking about where kids get cultural capital from, and it may not be in the schools. So I think that's why I'm bothered about the limits of this. And the, one of the best example of changing the lives of mothers to change the lives of children is in Winifred Holtby, Dorothy Sayre's great friend, also at Somerville, in her novel South Riding, where Lydia is the oldest child in, a, in an underclass family. Her mother dies with her umpteenth pregnancy, and Lydia therefore has to leave the grammar school to look after all the other children. And that's one of the three great narratives in that novel, is the way in which things that are nothing they are to do with poverty, but they're not to do with the schooling. Lydia is lying on the top of the shed reading Shakespeare when she hears that her mother has died and she's got to leave school. And it's that loss of that get, you know, that dream, which is particularly worrying. But I don't think the solution is in the school. Now, I'm just going to say three very quick things, I promise. Um, the first thing is I do think that England and Wales there was a big problem when they went, we went comprehensive. And it was a problem around co-education. We know from Eileen Byrne that girls' secondary models were catastrophic because they had no qualified teachers in and no facilities to teach girls any science. They taught girls laundry, cooking, and needlework, which were not things which would give you any job that would give you any income. They didn't teach girls auto mechanics or plumbing or electrical, anything that would have given girls anything. We go comprehensive, so then we have kids in schools where there are facilities, but we have a choice curriculum which allows girls not to do STEM subjects. And it allows boys not to do languages or childcare or needlework or cooking. And how many men in this room actually left school unable to sew on a button? You know. It's deeply, deeply, and I think when we went comprehensive in the 60s, we should have insisted on having a common curriculum with no choice that actually dealt with those gender inequalities in giving people skills that would take them into the labour market. And if I could wind history back, I would love to have been around in the Wilson government and said, we can't let kids choose at 14 what they do, because that's when the power of the peer culture is at its most acute, and the peer culture is so desperately sex-stereotyped and disruptive, and of course it's more sex-stereotyped in the working classes in general than it is, you know. There's less sex-stereotyping in the sort of young women who go to Rodi for all sorts of reasons to do with class and cultural capital, and the sort of teachers who teach them. We have a real problem that we allow a peer culture, which is very powerful, to influence young people to make effing stupid choices at the worst possible time. So if I could wind myself back to one policy question, it would be, we should go back to Circular 1065, and we should say, the whole point of going comprehensive is to make sure that both sexes get a broad curriculum which skills them for employment. And we've got girls leaving school now who are as unqualified to support families and earn a decent living as their great-grandmothers were. And that seems to me the great gender-related, poverty-related tragedy. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. So, up before. <laughs>
debate going quickly. Can I just, uh, Laurie. Sarah, thank you so very much. It's, it's just great to get your advice <laughs> for the Beer at Commission. I just want to hasten to add, to put your mind at ease, that the focus is not solely on schools, but across the four jurisdictions and indeed internationally. It and does it, say schooling quite a lot in the documents, doesn't it? Perhaps it does, but if Gabrielle was here, she would be quick to tell you that the sixth seminar, which is going to be in Manchester at the Abraham Moss Community School, so a setting outside the universities, um, but it is to involve communities, local communities. So, and we have been so mindful of school policies and social policies sitting side by side. So I just wanted to mm. say that to But I think, I think I want, I want to say that I think there's, there's two issues up. One is, I'm absolutely with Jeff, and even, I haven't helped, I'm going to ever agree with John Goldfield about anything ever before. But, you know, it's a bit ridiculous to think that schools can stop people smoking, eat a healthy diet, and it's even more ridiculous that schools can actually do very much. But I think there are lots of things where education can be effective, but I suspect quite a lot of them are not, not in school settings, and I'm delighted to hear what you've just said to me. Two very quick points. I, I learned to sew on a button in the Boy Scouts, actually. So. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, which is interesting, because that's yes. not school settings. No. But and I, it, I've kind of forgotten absolutely. And those sorts of badges. I, I was ahead of you. I learned in the Wolf Cup. Yeah, well, Absolutely. Maybe, yeah, yeah, maybe have, well, you see, that's exactly the kind of thing, isn't it? Where credentials on the table there. I don't want to talk about budgets at all. The other point I wanted to make was about what you said about prison education very early on. Interestingly, a member of, and because you were urging Vera to take yeah. this seriously, fun enough, last week I was sitting at the Vera Council, I didn't know where it was, yeah. with a colleague who's, recently, who's on the Vera Council who is planning an event that under the yeah. resources is on prison education yeah. to take place early next yeah. year. So yes. I hope we can invoke... But it would, actually, it would actually be in many families where you've got men spark going in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out, yeah. coming out each time less able to do it yeah. in the labour market. And, um, I mean, I don't know a single person who's involved in prison education movement in England and Wales who doesn't think that it is now so catastrophically hopeless. And I, I can't imagine that I feel like Calvin, and I mean, you know, but I was a bit, I'd written this before he said that. But it is just, I, I tell you one thing, whenever I get in a taxi with a taxi driver who seems to me to be somewhere to the right of Farage, and they start on about, blah, 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 um, I, I found that the dyslexia among the prison population shuts them up completely. They say, well, what would you do then? And I said, right, well, if I, if I were in charge of the just, Ministry of Justice in England, I would make sure that every incoming prisoner was tested for dyslexia, because you know most male prisoners are dyslexic, and that's why they're not very well educated. And I would test them all, and I wouldn't let them out of prison until they could read. No, I don't believe that. <laughs> but it shuts up fascist taxi drivers. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, because they, they, change, they change the subject, and then we can talk about... Most of the taxi drivers are having London and Millwall support, so then we can talk about Millwall, which is a nice, safe, neutral topic. Because um, I don't care about Millwall, but I can sympathise with them. Um, but if you ever want someone to shut up fascist taxi drivers, and it works in America as well, if you get very right-wing Trumpy sort of if you say to them, do you know the proportion of men in prison in America who actually are dyslexic but never had a test, so they never had a fair crack at education, unlike posh people's sons, um, and they don't know, and I've got no idea which is in America, but I bet it's mega there too, and it, it'll sh close down. So if you don't want to have a confrontational thing about being a wet liberal, that's the best strategy I've found. Can I just um, ask you about this notion of... A employment for uh, education for work because one of the issues I had is about the the um, stripping out as I understand it of the curriculum of domestic subjects oh yes of, so that not only were girls not in the past not taught plumbing but at least they were taught cookery and or some cookery I mean macaroni what was I to, how to cook mm. macaroni cheese 
but they they were they were um, they they did have that kind of basis, um, and the idea was that the, both girls and boys should do domestic subjects, plumbing for girls, and mm. that, that's has that been stripped now out of the curriculum because it's not related to employability. I'm I, I'm asking it, and if and if so, that is the why the, these catastrophic statistics on people's health. And food well, it and is how they fascinating, isn't it? If one were an advocate for the old-fashioned home economics domestic science, you could hear the old-fashioned teachers of that saying, "Yes, why have we got the obesity crisis? Because neither sex can cook yeah. now. We could have taught them." Do you remember those lovely pictures of Prince William at Eton having his pre-university cooking class? Um, you know, and if, if Eton is doing it, uh, why isn't Mucking Lane? You know, uh. I mean, because that's nothing about the army. They don't teach. They don't teach the recruits to cook. But doesn't the army have any education service? Because I understand under under uh, when they had uh, recruitment national service, it actually educated whole. Dr you oh, know, yeah. Whole well, oh, when 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 it was national service, of course, recruits who had no literacy at all got intensive literacy. Yes, right. Um, I'm now talking about young men who go in. I don't think they can get in if they're completely literate. But the point is they are unskilled school leavers with no GCSEs mostly now. And in the infantry, if they go into something else, other they regiments, they get. But the, the poor bloody infantry come back from Afghanistan. Their heads, you know, they're absolutely got major. But they, are, they aren't skilled at anything except yomping across the bank carrying big packs. The infantry don't get any training. It's, that sort of thing about join the army and we'll teach you to be a yeah, chef. That used to be. That that, used well, to be. but it's not, it's not generic across all the things. It depends what you go into. If you go into an armoured regiment, then you will get some driving. If you go into an infantry regiment, you get nothing. And that's where, that's where all the issues about homelessness. And the six-month pre-discharge programme is not based on putting them back into communities where they're going to live when they come out. It's in, it, they, they do that near where their regiment barracks is. So if they, it could be at Catterick when they're going to go back to Liverpool. And what, of course, we ought to have is a pre-discharge programme mm. back where they think they're going to live, which locates them with the TA and the British Legion, where there'd be some older blokes who've been there, done that, and had their foot blown off. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, it's horrible. Uh, it's not that. But also we give them no, and we've got a classic class distinction, because if you come out of the Royal Welsh whatevers as an officer, you have six months on full pay to do unpaid internships in the City of London. You go around three merchant banks and two whatevers, you know, paid for by the taxpayer because the officers coming out have to be able to find lovely jobs where they can go on playing tennis and, you know, <coughs> it's, it's a nice and a completely hidden class inequality. Because, of course, the officer class already have their children paid in fee-paid schools. Yeah. Now, I don't think the general public even knows that either. If you're an officer, your children get boarded at a public school while you're in the army. <coughs> Infantry people don't. Their kids get booted about with disorderly education. Sorry, that was a... a can, I, can, I, can, I, can I just support Laurie? I mean, I think Sarah's challenge is a really good challenge, actually, for us, you know? Uh, what excites me about it, and why I'm becoming involved in the way I have, is, it, is because I think you know, we are trying to challenge what has been, certainly in terms of policy and thinking of you know, what Jeff had to say, the whole kind of school effectiveness improvements sort of paradigm has become increasingly dominant. I mean, its influence in policy, Jeff, has been considerable in England and in Wales, perhaps less so in Scotland and Northern Ireland, but it's been influential there. And I think one of the things that we're actually doing is exposing that the kind of searchlight that Jeff is suggesting. Not to dismiss it, because I don't think we should dismiss it, but to encourage it perhaps to be a bit more reflective and humble, as it were, in terms of what it says to the political class. And by asserting the importance of the other people themselves and their views, peer cultures, families, communities, to get that kind of directive, not to see necessarily that we've got, again, some kind of silver bullet that can solve the problems of poverty in society, but to recognise, and that's been, I think, captured beautifully by Bob Putman in his book, Our Kids, in the American context, of actually there dismissing what has become an industry in the States, the school improvement 
Mm -hmm. And actually saying when you go back to communities and look what's happening in our poorest communities, it's only through those communities and the families within them that we can see the points of the growth. So I think that's the exciting. I think Sarah's challenge is absolutely the right one. We shouldn't get sucked in to seeing schooling and schools as being the solution. Yeah, that, that I too think is a really good challenge. We'll carry on discussing. And uh, one um, quick thing on that: um, I was teaching in, in Wiltshire after Bristol, um, where there were a lot of military um, bases in the Wiltshire, so a lot of kids come from military backgrounds. But it was only till I was living in Wiltshire that I realised there were actually communities which were which were actually mothers and children, and so we had the children come to our school. And the reason they were there is because they were battered uh, wives of, of, of military coming back, mostly at the time in Afghanistan, um, uh, Iraq as well. And those kids were in school, of course, often with major social difficulties mm -hmm. um, that, yeah, that, that we were trying to deal with as teachers. So, yes, you're right, it is without schools as well, but it also goes back into schools. And I think that's one of the things, thinking about, that these, often these kids, by the way, were in extreme poverty because the <laughs> state didn't support these women particularly well, though they had housing, but they didn't support them much out, outside of that. Um, so, yeah, I think that And they, of course, needed a really good remedial education programme so that they could then actually be skilled up with free childcare while they did it in order for them to be able to earn living not have to be on that benefit cycle. But we're, we're going to carry on this debate. Um, um, being of, of the old school teacher, we've got an hour for lunch because <laughs> that's... Uh,